So you have also to be willing to search and look for answers and work and practice and work and practice. And you have the right environment for it. You have workshop for to prepare you to be an entrepreneur and to understand, you know, cash flow, business, um, production, uh, markup, uh, marketing. I went to Every, to see everything as much as possible to understand okay if i want to make my business happen then i should be looking at this at everything welcome to or welcome back to fashion career stories my name is luc silva edward i'm a career strategist and leadership coach specialized in the fashion and luxury industry my role is to help you design a successful life and career in one of the most glamorous industry on the planet but also one of the most competitive. For that reason, I interview each week fashion professionals at different stages of the career in order to decode the best practices, tactics, and strategies. My hope for you is that you will find in this conversation some inspiration and insight that will help you build your professional journey in the world of fashion and luxury. Today, I have the great pleasure to receive Steven Passaro. Steven is a menswear designer who, after several years in different fashion houses, decided to launch his own brand in the middle of COVID. He has been showing his collection at Paris Fashion Week for a few seasons now, and he is recognized for his capacity to offer a more sensitive and delicate wardrobe to men. His designs are based on the rigorous fundamentals of tailoring, but are enhanced by a more modern and genderless approach. I wanted to talk to Stephen because he has a very strong philosophy about the purpose of his brand and a clear vision of what he desires to bring to menswear. His ideas are encapsulated in his, this sentence. I quote, Expressing your deepest self. True strength come from this act of vulnerability. End of quote. Through each collection, Stephen offers to his client an opportunity for self-discovery and self-expression. This conversation with Stephen is an opportunity to shine a light on his journey so far and to understand how one can create a fashion brand from scratch. I invite you to discover Stephen's creation on Instagram at Stephen Passaro, S T E V E N. P A S R R O and visit his eShop at www.stevenpassaro.com. In this episode, you will learn about how to leverage a more analytical mindset in the world of fashion design. What are the missions of a visual merchandiser? How to protect yourself from being put inside the box? the best practices to keep a clear head within the fashion industry, how to make a memorable portfolio that showcases all your skill sets, and how to redefine menswear while creating a new vision of masculinity. And with no further ado, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Steven Passado. Hey, if you're still enjoyed this episode and want to support the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. This is the most efficient way to help us grow and entice people to listen to the show. So don't be shy, hit those five stars and show us some love in the comment section. Hi Steven, how are you? Hello Luca, I'm good in you. Thank you for having me today. Hi. Thank you for, for accepting the invitation. So I'm really pleased to, to have you in, uh, in this episode because we met not so long ago uh, during the Sphere uh, showroom here in, uh, in Paris during the last uh, Menswear Fashion Week. And we exchanged and, and I thought it would be really interesting to, to have you uh, on the podcast to talk about uh, what does it take to create uh, you know, a brand today? What does it take to work in the menswear uh, you know, industry? And, and before we get into all of that, uh, I just wanted to, if you could give us a little bit more uh, about why that, uh, when that passion for fashion uh, started and why, what was kind of like the, the different step you took to become a, a designer. Interesting. Um, 
because I have a very uh, unusual path. Uh, like my background, I started with um, basically technology with a baccalaureate in France. Um, so more electronic uh, engineering. <laughs> Um, okay. And I thought I didn't like it because it was just a lot of math um, and I wanted to be more creative. Uh, so I decided to go into the creative applied arts field. Uh, and you know, the first year you do a bit of everything from architecture to set design, fashion, communication. Um, and what I really liked was actually doing everything um, and have like a wide vision. Um, but of course, in France, you have to choose. So I choose to go to set design architecture. Um, and during this two year degree, I actually had uh, two internships at Dior uh, in the VM department. Uh, and anytime I had a garment in my hands, I was like, how it is made and look at the finishes. I want to understand the construction. Um, and after that, I was like, okay, actually architecture is too big. The project take, uh, take too long to achieve them. So I was like, okay, maybe I should try fashion. Um, so I took evening classes in Paris and then I applied for the London College of Fashion in London, um, got accepted, uh, and I went to do my studies there. So this is how okay. I really moved into it. And also I think back in the, um, when I joined the applied arts, it was the time my queen was alive working with show studio. It was the time of Garrett Pugh with Lady Gaga. This, entire creative, massive uh, uh, energy. And I was like, I want to go there. I want to be in London. I want to be part of the, this industry. Super interesting, the, the beginning part of uh, technology. Um, how did you decide, like, uh, let's say, let me rephrase. What was the thought process to kind of the, choose your studies? Because you say that you like technology, you like math, creativity. What, what does it mean, creativity, for you at that, uh, at that age? Um, I was always creative in my hands, always making stuff, uh, whether it was painting, whatever. And I thought I really like to, I need to express something as well. Um, so I really wanted to move to applied arts. Um, I think something more different. Um, also, you know, when you live, I was living back in the days in the suburb of Paris, you don't have many choices to, for, you know, because there's a back actually for applied arts but I didn't have the choice to go there. So I was like, okay, I need to find something that would suit me, uh, but closer to my parents' house. Um, so that's how it happened. And then I was, even though I was good at it, I didn't like it. Um, mm. So moving to applied arts, then I started to experiment a bit of everything. I was like, oh, it's actually, this is fun and I'm good at it. Um, so yeah, that's how we, I moved to, to it. Okay. Something interesting you said, like, because uh, it happened in the career, especially at the beginning, sometimes we, uh, we study something, we don't like it so much, but we know sometimes it's a mandatory step to do something else bigger. How did you deal at that time, maybe with that part of, you know, that frustration, let's say? Um, I would say when I had to choose to go uh, after the first year in applied arts, and then you have to choose between fashion, architecture, set design, everything it was complicated in my mind because I was like, people asked me to choose a box and I don't fit in this box. And I think to be honest with you now and to be honest with myself, I choose the safest thing to do, uh, the mm. job where I will be safer. So set design architecture is safer because people always need to be in a house and covered uh, to have a roof on top of the head. And uh, now looking at fashion at that point was like, oh my God, this is, messy, complicated, um, long hours of work, can't make it, uh, working for a big fashion house, everything. Uh, but then of course the passion, um, gets you and then you, you catch up and then you're like, okay, then actually I can't do this. I need to go to fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love how honest you are and transparent you are with, with yourself because it is true when we have to kind of think about our path, uh, especially in a younger age, we like, okay, that's the safe path. I'm sure to have a job or at least more options to have a job. Uh, but at the end, there is always something in us. If we don't choose the right path that kind of tell us, okay, but your passion is here. And so that's why it's so important to have those let's say, introspection moments, even when you are, when you are young and take some risk, you know, try to, Yes. Express and try is not 
easy to, to, to do that sometimes at the beginning, but at the end is the, usually the right path uh, leads you to more opportunities. I wanted to go back a little bit about your first experience at, uh, at Dior. Can you tell us a little bit uh, more about it and what does it mean to, to work in that department? Big fashion house. Uh, of course. So um, I remember actually before going to Dior, I was supposed to choose between going to Dior or to Obo Global, which is a production uh, shoe production company uh, for fashion events. Um, and I thought, you, as stupid as it sounds or naive, it's you need a big name on your CV, Steven, just go to Dior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was very lucky because I know I was in a safe space. The team was absolutely lovely. Um, I still, I'm still still in touch with some people from there, actually. Um, and you arrive at this, you know, Maison de Couture uh, place. Um, so you have glitters in your eyes. It's like magical. <laughs> um, so... And the way they treated me was as I was actually part of the team and not an intern at the time. Um, and so from the beginning, very involved in the projects, research, making, doing uh, installation at Guerrilla Lafayette, um, Montaigne, uh, going to see the suppliers, finding suppliers. So it was the first um, real experience in fashion. I was like, wow, this is interesting. You're, there's a, actually a proper business industry of making clothes and what does it mean to make clothes and communicate about clothes and um, actually learn so much in terms of visuals uh, and of course merchandising from how you know you set your collection in a showroom. So of course it's very useful even for me today when I go to Sphere and like, okay, we need to do the merchandising, the color, the team of the collection, how people go through, you know, the different levels of the garments, how it does it look. Um, of course I learned a lot thanks to a lot of people there. Um, and I didn't know it was kind of like so important that they have such a big department for merchandising. Yeah, can you, for somebody who doesn't know what does it mean merchandising or architecture department, can you tell us a little bit more about what do, what that department does and what are kind of the main missions in it? So the main mission I would say it's to translate and showcase the collection in the stores or the window design um, to reflect the identity of the brand. Um, it's really that it has to be visually beautiful and impactful for the um, client and for everyone that just sees the collection, they're like, okay, I want to see it, touch it, buy it, <laughs> uh, literally, to make it more simple. Um, of course, it's creating the window design, the um, and back in the days, it was bringing the idea of the, sh the set design from the catwalk to the store and to the window and pop-up events. So it's translating the first concept and adapt it to the window design and uh, store design. Ah, excellent. And what would you say are the, the skills that uh, a young intern arriving to that type of uh, department uh, should develop or, and what is the mindset they, 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 might, they might have to, to succeed in it? Uh, I would say creativity, um, a bit of technical skills. Of course, you need to know Adobe, uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, some 3D software. Um, I think it's also a taste of color and texture uh, mm. because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, mood, but like in 3D. Uh, mm -hmm. and playing around with the different type of garments around. Um, that would be uh, the main, and of course, curiosity, team play, uh, teamwork um, around it. But then, yeah, that's the main uh, skills and knowledge needed. And, and uh, oh, what recommendation would you do to, to those starting their career in terms of um, how they can, you know, apply those skills or at least uh, nourish them? I mean, in terms of inspiration or activities that you, you think uh, could, could nourish those skills? Um, it's very cliche, uh, but going out <laughs> is something really good. Uh, you need to go see exhibitions. You need to go nourish yourself traveling um, because it's easy also when you're in Paris to be in a bubble of, you know, you see the same exhibition as everyone and you go to the same place as everyone, but it stays very niche. Um, I think... Everyone has a personal story. 
uh, a personal background and they can dig into this as well, no matter where the people come from. Traveling has been helping me so much when I actually lived in London. Uh, my parents are from Portugal, so going to Portugal as well. Um, going to factories, but it's just really weird, but you need to see and explore the world as much as possible um, to feed your mind, feed your creativity. Uh, sometimes something very stupid, last time I went to see a building and I was like, oh my God, the flooring is beautiful, this marble. Um, let me take a picture of this detail because I like the, the shade on it with the white and the greens and really weird. <laughs> but again, that helped me to build some certain ideas in my mind. And then when you're twerking, you're like, okay, I saw this kind of shape. I like the shape of it. Let's translate it to fashion, for instance. Um, mm. So exploring and nature, um, nature helps a lot, I think, to also calm the mind and get inspiration from clearer thought thinking, I would say. Quick announcement before we jump back into a conversation. Working in our industry, it's such a thrilling experience. We have a worldwide cultural impact. We help bring to life amazing products and customer experiences. And there is always something new to discover and no time to get bored. However, sometimes such intensity doesn't make easy to take a step back and we lose sight of what really matters to us. Sometimes, in the heat of action, we forget to reflect on our journey so far and to think about where we are heading to with our life and career. That's what coaching is for. It offers you a dedicated moment to think and strategize about the type of career you want to build, the kind of leader you want to be, and the type of changes you want to implement. To work in our industry is to strive for excellence, and that starts by you being able to perform at your best. So if lately you have been feeling overwhelmed or unable to think clearly, lacking motivation and seeing your performance decrease, or simply that you are at a crossroad in your career and wants to get to the next level in terms of management and responsibility, please reach out and let's talk about how we can work together. As a certified coach, I will help you ask yourself better and more powerful questions, design powerful strategies to reach out to your goals, and get clarity on your priorities. Contact me on LinkedIn at Lucas Silva Edwards and let's talk during a 30 minute complimentary meeting. And now let's dive back into our conversation. I love what you said that, uh, you know, taking inspiration everywhere. I love the anecdote about, about the floor because it's true sometimes in terms of inspiration. We, as you say, we think it's, oh, it's stupid or it's just there or, but at the end, it's important to kind of trust yourself. Like if there is something that interests you, just take a picture or take a note and, and that could become something useful, as you say, for a collection, if you translate it to fashion. But it's true in the younger years, it's, it's really interesting to kind of explore and, and trust your, your gut feelings kind of to go into different direction. Even you don't know where, where, where is uh, going after. I think that you just said trusting your guts is the best because it's so easy to get inspiration from Pinterest, which is already pre-digested for you. Um, so when I create something new, uh, like a new collection, I try to avoid all this Pinterest thing because it's already there. It won't be something new and fresh because it already exists, even though it can give you some ideas and differently. It's way better to just go somewhere else like that you don't know and you're like, okay, let's start from scratch. Uh, what can I see around me that can help me to build something new? Yeah. yeah. I want to go back to something you say about nature. And uh, do you have any like practice to kind of calm your mind, suit your mind? Because, you know, the rhythm of fashion, it's so intense. We have to be creative all the time. Any, any recommendation or practice that uh, you have? There's a lot of stuff I, wish I should, I can't say, I cannot say. I would say. <laughs> Um, I do love to go on holiday, um, uh, on quiet spaces. So even mm -hmm. Paris and city for me, it's too difficult to live in, um, back in London, you have a lot of parks and green space where you actually mm. can, like, rest and be by the water. Um, what I tend to do when in Paris is just go to my parents in the suburb because they have a big garden and they live next to the forest. So walking there, um, on a daily basis, um, I'm very introvert sometimes. So I just like to be at home with the good music, uh, light some incense or candle, 
um, and just reflect with a you know very you know very specific mood. The light is very you know a bit orangey. Uh, yeah. Sounds very spiritual as well. I know. Um, I used to do a lot of yoga meditation, um, and I should go back to it right now. To be honest, because it's getting more hectic at work as well. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of things uh, out of even at the therapist coach to help me get my mind focused all the time. Um, I work a lot on myself to be able to handle all the stress uh, and the rhythm because it's a lot all the time. Yeah, I like what you said that uh, you know focus on nature, quiet space. Um, I think as you as you were mentioned that we think that we start something we we give up and then we have to start again like meditation or therapy or yoga uh, and at the end it's just a practice and I believe that uh, yeah we experiment things we lose them we go back to them but it's always good to have at least to know that it's good to implement those elements especially like as you say when it's become a hectic and we feel it to have a quiet space to have a mood I love that you create like a, an entire like moment for you because you know habits are, are really in, in, important and uh it's something that we don't do so often when we are young maybe the new generation do it more often because it's become more uh, well known uh but i know it's not so easy to do it at the at the beginning because we want to explore so many things so i like that uh that, that creation of a, a specific moment to think and and uh, and uh, reflect um i wanted to continue a little bit more about like um so you did your internship at, at Dior, and then you say you moved to London to go to that energy. We're talking about Lady Gaga, Guy Pug, uh, all, all of those. How did you choose to, to the school? How was the, the process? Or um, even you, where were, where were the doubts at that moment? Um, where to start? Uh, so I applied in Paris first. Um, but I got rejected because I didn't do uh, the two-year degree in fashion. I did set design. So they told me, no, you actually are not on the right path for us, which I found very rude and difficult at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, in the same time, I was in a really bad state of mind at the uh, back in the days. Uh, so I had a big burnout in my life, and it was kind of like triggering something. Um, so, of course, I deal with myself and uh, my mental health was much better. And I decided I was like, okay, I'm gonna apply for London. Um, and of course, when you think about London, you think about St. Joseph Martins and London Kajo Fashion, which is a bit well uh, less known, but as good in terms of quality, uh, even better actually some, on certain skills. Uh, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna apply for it and see what happened. Um, so I got accepted at LCF uh, for the graduate diploma, which is the uh, like a year um which is license pro in french um and i was like okay good um i'm living in paris uh going abroad it's my dream let's just go uh i arrived in london for the first year um so it, it was kind of uh, a year to learn how fashion works but in uk school um absolutely loved it and I was like, okay, maybe I should apply for the master's then and then see what happened. Even though I didn't have the money, um, I applied for the master's. I got the scholarship for the master's and then did the master's, of course. Um, so it was kind of like my best years so far in my life uh, to be in London. Because instead of, compared to Paris and the way I've been taught architecture, uh, they, com they don't compare you to other students. They push mm -hmm. you in your own way. Mm. So it's like, you like this? Okay, why? Go deeper, uh, push it. Why are you interested in this? What, what does it resonate within you? Um, I was really focusing on why I'm here, why I want to be a designer, why I'm offering uh, as a designer, what's the product, why I like it, um, what does it mean in the current market? Um, so it was very nurturing and nourishing in terms of creativity compared to what was been in Paris, for instance. Um, but that's how I started to think, okay, if even when I was there remembering um, Garrett Pugh, McQueen, I got the, I understood why creativity was bigger in London than Paris. Yeah, that's super interesting, the different way of uh, teaching and 
it seems like there is in Paris, uh, it's more about the rules and how things are done. And in London, it's how you develop your own creativity using the different fields of expression that uh, available to you. So it sounds once developed the creativity, the other ones developed the know-how in, in more general way, if I understand well. It's yeah, definitely. And, um, and even though I came from like an architecture design background, they actually said, oh my God, amazing, because you're going to bring something new to the, to the fashion. And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> that's not the same, um, you know, um, words I heard, I, heard, I heard in Paris. It, it was completely opposite. Yeah. They were wel welcoming me. So I was like, okay, there I am. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it's amazing. And it's a good, uh, good thing to know for people who want to work in the field and where they can go according where, where, where it fit, as the, fit them the best. And, and so what happened, um, now before we continue to your, your, your journey, what would you say are the, the main uh, key learnings that you got from those, those years at LSF? LCF? Um, LSF, sorry. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, I think I learned a lot from my tutor, um, Darren Cabin. I'm still in touch with him actually. I saw him a couple of weeks ago in London for the, actually, LCF MA show. Um, it's really funny because the way it works is that you have class two days and then the rest of the week it's you on your own so you have also to be willing to search and look for answers and work and practice and work and practice um, and you have the right environment for it it means you have a big library you have a big department for tech for instance you have workshop for to prepare you to be an entrepreneur and to understand you know cash flow business um production uh, markup uh, marketing it's not mandatory but you can have access to it so i went to every, to see everything as much as possible to understand okay if i want to make my business happen then i should be looking at this at everything um and I remember always uh, some of my tutors saying, I want you, when you leave the course, to be employable. And mm. then the other, uh, our technician, Sylvia, she would say, I want you to make sure you know how to make your own design because you are the one getting the jobs after. And this is the difference with Paris because most people in Paris, they choose creative direction, basically, or making know-how. And in London, they joined the two together, mostly. Now it's a bit changing, of course, in Paris recently. <laughs> but that's the difference that I saw back in the days. Um, and it was only five years ago, <laughs> four, more or less. Um, but that's what I learned from them. It's like, know how to make that. Uh, it's super interesting. And I like uh, your, your recommendation about like, you know, explore everything that you have in the schools. And even though, like, uh, you don't know if you're going to launch your brand or not, at least have the basic knowledge in all fields and remembering, as you were saying earlier, it's a business. So there is other departments, there is cash flow, there is accounting, there is production. You know, it's uh, at the end of the day, they, they, cre creation is just one aspect of the fashion uh, industry. So it's a, it's a really it's, good uh, 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 advice. And so what happened after you finished, uh, you graduated and you finished your, your master? So luckily I, I ended up the top 10 of the class. So we have an in-house show uh, for family and friends. And then there's a selection of 12 people out of the 30 that go to the press show for the London Fashion Week. Um, so of course, very exciting got into the show um one of the best memory i have from london um and then from there you get a little bit of press you know you have days coming id and then you're like okay what do i do now um actually the first thing i, I did was going on holiday after three years with no <laughs> <laughs> um it's for like two weeks like okay i'm gonna do a bit of reset and then let's see what i do um, and what I've done is I actually got a small studio because I have a bit of um, budget from my loan left. And I was thinking, okay, Brexit is a bit in six months. 
let's see what happens. And unfortunately, I had to move back to Paris uh, because Brexit did a big mess in the UK. Mm. And I decided then to go back to, to Paris uh, and work for fashion houses, or at least try to. Um, and what happened is I worked freelance um, a little bit, and I worked also as um, for like small um, missions with Interim, um, with uh, Hermes, Louis a uh, couple of times, and then we went straight to COVID. So it was kind of like a, a weird time um, mm. where I was a bit lost, but at the same time, I had a fire in me saying to me, like, you need to make a collection. You need to get out there. You need to make things happen. And luckily, I bought all the fabrics the day of the lockdown, before the lockdown. And then I locked myself in my flat with the fabric, the sewing machine. And I was like, OK, now I have time to do the collection, make the collection, and then see what happens. Amazing. So did you know that you wanted to launch your, your collection really early? Or is, is it like, uh, as you said, like uh, that moment in between after graduation and looking for jobs and mission that you decided, OK, I want to launch my collection? It's funny because, you know, you, you're trying to get out there, to, like to get a job. Uh, London was dead in terms of job because I was French, so they didn't know what yeah. was happening with the law. Um, in Paris was the same. Luckily, I met um, a friend of mine. She was my coach at the time. And she told me like, you in a fashion house, you're going to go crazy because I'm very organized. I know how to do a lot of things. And if they put me in a box, I just don't function properly uh, because they're going to ask me to do one task and my brain does three at the same time. <laughs> um, met the uh, HR from like a big... Um, uh, what's it called, um, company for head hunting, basically. And she was like, I'm going to, I won't give you a job. You're going to go out there, make your collection and you're going to apply for the prices and whatever, and try to make it happen because you can do it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, she just met me. And just, she says that looking at my portfolio. So I was like, maybe she's right. And I should do it. And of course, no job because of COVID. So. I took the opportunity saying, okay, let's make a collection. Uh, won't cost much because I know how to make everything uh, or almost. And then that's what happened. Um, made a collection. I showed a couple of friends. I met a few people, uh, a bit of two, three people from the press. They, they took to their friends and then I started to build my network. And then a year and a half later, I joined Paris Fashion Week. Amazing. So it's really interesting how somebody can just see your portfolio and already know that you have the potential to make your 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 own brain did you did you know do you know what what kind of uh, give her that uh, intuition i think looking back at my, even my portfolio when i look at it you can see um design you can see numbers finance you can see technical files for production you can see me making the things, the twirling, the final product, and the lookbook with the final imagery. Okay. So you can see literally a small business within a portfolio. Um, yeah. I was not really aware of that at the time, but of course, now I've met so many people and I'm like, okay, now I, I know why they said that. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, and you know, at the beginning, you don't trust yourself because I came off to Paris thinking, I want to know, I want to compare my skills to compare to the average people in Paris and how they work in the fashion houses. Um, thinking, okay, I need to, you know, understand my level. Um, and at that moment, I was like, okay, maybe I should try to do things and see what happens. And that's how it started, basically. Yeah, amazing. Um, before we go into the, your, your, your brand, I have a, a question because you mentioned it uh, several times that you are sometimes uh, followed by coaches or therapists. Well, um, why is it important in your case? And uh, do you recommend it for people like building the, the, um, the brand? To me, it was quite needed uh, because I said to you, I had a like, massive burnout back uh, before going to London. So since that time, I always... I understood that I need to talk and to understand a lot of things on myself to work better. Um, 
at the beginning was supposed to be only coaching for a uh, technical aspect of the garments to improve and improve and improve. Yeah. And then it ended up being 360 vision of uh, me, my work, me, my trauma, my past, my vision of work and everything. Um, to me, everything is connected. Um, my work is about um, changing, evolving, um, fluidity, breaking certain rules. Um, so the ref basically what I did in therapy, it's what I do with my clothes. Um, so it was kind of like, if I go to the deeper level of understanding, um, there's kind of a process that I do with my clothes that I did in therapy. Um, it's really wearing something that's going to help you being more you. And then the question mm. is, who are you? But you yeah. are always changing, evolving to understand who you are actually. Um, simple as that, but into clothes. <laughs> hey, I've got some exciting news for you. Until the end of the year, I'm offering a whooping 50% off my usual rate. That means you can get one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me for only 60 euros per hour. But here's the catch. There is only 100 hours of discounted session available. Why? Let me tell you. As a coach, I'm always looking to improve my skills and help my clients achieve their goals. That's why I've decided to pass the level one of the International Coaching Federation, known as ACC, for Associate Certified Coach. To obtain this certification, I will need to complete at least 100 hours of coaching over the next 12 months. And I want you to be part of the journey. So if you want to discover coaching or know someone who might benefit from it, please reach out on LinkedIn at Luca Silva Edwards. Whether you are facing a personal or professional challenge or want to get clarity on your next career move, I will be able to help. I have experience in a wide range of topics, including self-confidence, work-life balance, team communication, as well as management and leadership. And if you are going through a career transition or need help assessing your skills, that's one of my specialties. Again, reach out on LinkedIn at Lucas Silva Edwards and let's talk during a 30 minute complimentary meeting. And now let's go back to our conversation. How do you do translate that into the, you know, into your brand today, today, because you focus on menswear and, uh, so the question is like, uh, why uh, men's wear specifically and how does it translate into So from the beginning, uh, I need to project myself into clothes to be able to make something. Um, so far that was the point. Um, I took the traditional tailoring, um, and I looked, you know, when you wear a jacket, uh, you can't actually move your arms freely up and down because you get stuck. <laughs> First thing I did was to um, create a back fold with a piece of jersey hidden that actually allows you to actually move freely in your suit. That was the first step to actually break this idea of toxic masculinity. Uh, in a simple way, that's 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 yeah, how yeah. It, in a symbolic yeah. way, but it, it's it probably give you that flexibility that uh, flexibility men don't break yeah. the codes of like. What, to, what it means to be a man, what it means to be masculine and everything. Mm. Um, and then even for the trouser, how can you have movement in the trouser? Well, then you had plissé, you had uh, Hakama style trousers. And that's what I to build the, the identity of the brand. Um, even now the logo is my full name, but the S is the shape of the Delta, which means difference. Um, so it's the different, it's being different. Uh, it's again, it's about being yourself, being different and embracing your identity. Um, on my case, then today I develop more the idea of delicate and sensible because I'm a person sensible. I know how many problem with that became a strength and to be, to show vulnerability is a strength. And I like also to play with this kind of like opposite ideas, but from my experience, the past few years, like the more you are vulnerable with people and with your work, you feel, you know, in danger kind of, but by being doing that, you actually are stronger because yeah. you know, the people can take it away from you. Um, yeah. and that's what I try to put in my closing collection is that feeling of this is sensible, delicate, but at the same time, super strong. 
you have the shoulder, the perfect cut, everything, but then the materials are like very soft, very gentle. Uh, you have like, you know, seal, which is a bit more feminine. You have a bit of cut out, which is about, as again, you have the body, which is a bit more sensual. Um, it's really mixing the two together. Um, and it's really you think about menswear because, um, so the last collection was the best, but the worst in terms of sales. <laughs> um, we are in a recession. And it's so funny because the first collection, I sold the pieces more to women than men's at the beginning. And back to this idea, um, I won't talk to, I want today to talk more about product vision. Um, and I'm going to extend the range to more feminine pieces, but I don't want to talk about women's wear, men's wear. Even though there's two types of body kind, uh, if I would say, I want to talk about feminine to masculine pieces on a wide product range and remove agenda, fluidity, all the new names, because I think it creates, it's important to have the conversation, but it creates divisions instead of bringing people together. And I want to create unity, not to split people. That's super interesting what you said that you, at the moment, at this current moment, you are thinking less uh, at the end about the concept and what you want to express, and more about like the construction of the collection and uh, and the, the pieces per, per se. Can you tell us a little bit about like uh, maybe the thought process and how you kind of uh, reorganize your your brand or the co the collection? Um, so so far, I was trying to focus uh, so on menswear mainly, but I will always get even um, women's wear buyer coming to me and like, I love the collection. Uh, actually, I could actually buy it for women's as well. Oh, interesting. My team is more female and they're always trying everything in <laughs> as well. So we were like, okay, maybe it's logical to actually add more feminine pieces as dresses, uh, more tailored jacket for like what with a narrow shoulder, um, fit more fitted waist, uh, and more fitted trouser for the female body. Um, it's just something more logical because there's a demand for it. Um, and it doesn't change the DNA of the brand, stays the same. It's really about, again, product, uh, growing, changing, evolving. Um, if you look at today, at even bigger brands are looking at even, uh, Bottega Veneta. You look at the latest, latest campaign. You don't know what's menswear, what's women's wear. It's products. Mm -hmm. Lifestyle, it's everyday wear, very high luxury, but who cares? We are, to me, this is more the vision I want to give to people as well. It's more about unity and removing names and boxes. Just look at it as, a, as what it is a product. If you like it, it fits you, wear it. Yeah. I love because it's go back to circle to what you said at the beginning that your brand and who you are, it's about evolution, change. And even your brand per se, it's evolving while you're creating it for different type of reasons, for demand, for creating that unity that you talk about, and that and the, maybe the market is already also for, for that. So it is, it is really interesting to, to see that you start a brand for some reasons, it evolves through time, and it's good you as a creative creator, designer, but also as a, you know, the founder of your business to be able to evolve with it and, and, and adapt. And um, last question, because I know we are running out of time. Mm, how is it to kind of, what are the challenge to uh, produce a brand, especially in France? You know, we have all those topic about uh, sustainability made in France, for example, how do you deal with, uh, with that? And what is your experience wow. around this topic? So, uh, so far, since I moved to London, uh, to Paris, I, I focused on Made in France because that was very important to me. Um, when I was at London, I was producing even my collection for my MA, some pieces in Portugal because my family is Portuguese. So it was also very easy to meet people. And when you are, you know, French and you go back to Portugal, there's that kind of like family connection. Um, and people are really willing to help you to, oh, you're young, oh, it's nice because you're interested into the, the, you know, the making and usually designer, they don't know about, you know, the making, but they know about the style, but they, you know, um, so it was really nice. Um, in France, you know, we have a lot of support. We have the Défi, uh, helping a lot of people. We have the Federations helping us as well. 
Um, and I try to be, you know, made in France as much as possible. The fact, the real truth, to be honest, is like when you're a small brand, you can find little atelier, uh, but they're very busy now um, because they are less and less skilled, to be honest. Um, there's so many things happening around trying to bring the skills back. But when you want to make a tailor jacket, for instance, that I do a lot, you don't find the skills anymore, except like a really, really high price. But then it doesn't match the market because the market, in some places in wholesale, they want a, a smaller price, but the same quality. So, you know, it's kind of like difficult because you want to be made in France, but then you want a quality and then you want a cheap price and it doesn't work all together. Um, so one, one more time I had to adapt and change. So I'm going to keep the highest pieces, image pieces um, for, um, for the made in France and then develop the entry level prices uh, in Port back to Portugal. Uh, because I can have sometimes better quality, I have to be transparent, and it's still made in Europe. Uh, I know the atelier, I go there, I visit them, um, and that's how I, uh, I'm, I'm intending to build more the brand. And on the other side, so I go lower in terms of prices to respond to the demand, and on the other side, in terms of image of the brand, we get a lot of requests for now, celebrities and VIP, uh, there's that tool jacket on the chest from last season uh, that already like been around the world almost in two weeks. <laughs> so I'm gonna push also this image in terms of like almost haute couture. I can't use that word, of I know, but mm. I have the skills with my team to achieve very high level of craftsmanship. So we're gonna mm. also push this image on the other side to keep the identity of the brand. Yeah. Thank you so much for that explanation between like you know the strategy like uh, the prices made in Portugal to keep the quality but you know uh, uh, um, make sure that in terms of business it work and also continue to nourish that craftsmanship that uh, make the more image and uh, the you know the how the, the brand is known around the world. So that was really good. Uh, before we wrap up, any anything that you want to add, uh, Stephen, any recommendation, uh, you know, like insight or learnings that you want to, to give to the, the people listening? Well, I would say, uh, I think we, we mentioned sustainability. Um, I think uh, the youngest generation, uh, maybe that we are fighting for it, um, it's not now marketing anymore. It has to be this way. Uh, on my side, I only work with uh, 3D design, uh, pattern catching technologies. We don't do any more twirling, uh, only one sample per design. Um, I really improved and developed this pipeline or um, throughout the years. Um, everyone has to bring their ID to the, to the front. Um, the groups, unfortunately, they're like behind. They are the one having the power and we need to make sure we are here to show them the right way and possibilities to develop um, for that. And for the younger generation, um, I think they need to be prepared because it's really hard. Uh, the market is complicated. Um, I know the paper, being a designer, sounds amazing and everything. Um, it is amazing, but it's also very challenging, demanding. And in some ways, creativity, it's also business, entrepreneur, it's finance, it's um, accounting, it's management, it's having a team, it's, you know, responsibilities. Um, designing is the fun, uh, but it comes with other skills to, to have. Amazing. Thank you a lot for, for your time, Stephen. I hope we're going to be able to do a part two uh... In a, in a few months and see where you are in your, in, in, in your brand. But uh, already, uh, thanks a lot for all those uh, good insights. Yeah, but, well, thank you so much, Luca, for having me today. So now you know what it really takes to create a brand from scratch. However, keep in mind that what is going to help you in the long run is the vision you would have set for your brand. Steven's ambition is to create a new vision of masculinity. What is yours? Personally, what I keep from this conversation is number one, the importance to stay true to yourself despite what the industry tells you or what challenges life throws at you. And to succeed at that, knowing yourself is key. 
So surround yourself with coaches or therapists early on into your journey in order to do the fundamental work that will translate into your creative endeavors. Number two, to launch a brand is to accept that creativity is only 50% of the job. So be curious and embrace the other 50%. Learn about entrepreneurship, accounting, management, logistics, networking. If you start early on, it will pay dividends in the long run. Number three, the main challenge that one can encounter today is to not let anyone put you inside a box. Sure, it's easier to put a label on someone, but the world of today is so complex that we can be one thing anymore. We need to embrace our diversity of practices and find a way to tell our story to the world. If you are persistent enough, they will eventually see it. If you are still hearing this, thank you so much for tuning in. I know how much your time is valuable. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. This is the most efficient way to help us grow and entice people to listen to the show. If you have any questions, comments, or requests, please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Until next time, I wish you a wonderful day.